Welcome to Press Review with me, Ian Martin, editor of Reaction, and I'm joined by my colleagues Maggie Pagano and Alistair Ben. Press Review is the show where we review the, the stories which have uh, grabbed our attention in the last seven days or so. This is the first episode of the new year. And already, I mean, in the UK, only really one story to, uh, to to focus on initially that's just dominating absolutely everything. And that's the fate of the Prime Minister in the wake of what people are calling party gates, though people seem to just attach the word gate to any, any scandal. But this row over parties. Uh, did Boris Johnson know he was attending a party? Did he know he was breaking the rules? Is dominating British politics and media. I mean, I'm going to ask you to go first, Alistair, with your first pick of it. But just before that, just a, just an indication of how much it is. The, it, it's the big story. It's in the, the lead in the FT. It's on Thursday morning. Johnson faces Tory calls to quit after attending lockdown party. Times defiant PM refuses to quit as polls slip further. The mail operation save Boris um, it makes it a splash. Uh, a bigger story really than uh, what happened to Prince Andrew, which is also a massive story in its own right, which which we'll come to later. And so, Alistair, can I ask you to kick off with your first pick on this subject? I've chosen. Uh, the actor Rory Kinnear uh, writing in The Guardian and the headline uh, pretty much speaks for itself. On the day of number 10's lockdown party, I buried my sister. And it's a, it's a very moving piece about um, you know, losing someone who, a family member who'd struggled with, with chronic illness and finally reaching you know the end and a funeral in sort of pitiful circumstances, hardly anyone there, everyone in PPE and a, and a wake with about three people where people at or plastic plates in, in their garden distanced two meters apart. And, and it's just, it's a really sort of, um, you know, it's a story that many of us will, will be familiar with friends or relatives going through, you know, a, a period when the kind of markers that we've used to welcome in things or say goodbye to them were suspended on the basis that we were protecting public health and in a, an emergency situation. Um, I, I think actually kind of moving back from that, you know, that really affecting story in that very extreme circumstance, um, this is what is so uh, frustrating and um, sort of enervating about what's happened with the revelations of a, a party on the May the 20th and the subsequent attempts to um, sort of wangle uh, their way out of it, especially from Boris yesterday, um, claiming in a highly sophistic you know, way that it was a work event. And, you know, you can understand why they're trying to claim that it was a work event, because they could claim it was falling within guidelines or an extension of the working day or all these other sort of um, ex excuses. But what fundamentally it fundamentally shows is that the, um, the human sympathy that was there in number 10 for their colleagues who were working di diff admittedly difficult circumstances and wanted to mark a period of intensity with a little shindig. That sympathy was never extended to the British public for months and months. I would have loved through work to have met up with colleagues distanced outside just to catch up, just to speak to someone I was working with, to mark yeah. the things we were doing, to, to assuage the sense of utter loneliness that this kind of tech um, facilitated lockdown uh, gener you know, you know, generated but it was against the rules it was against the law actually there was no such thing as a work event I would have loved that for there to been this lovely flexible approach where we were allowed to do things in low risk scenarios that would have made things a bit more bearable yeah. but we were not allowed that and and they should not have been behaving in that way 
uh, too. And that's why it makes me very angry. And I'm sure everyone will be angry at the hypocrisy and all that. But I think it's yeah. that sort of lack of empathy which really frustrates me. Very well put. And I, th I think, yeah, that really, that gets to the heart of it because there's a real danger in, in all of this. And I spent, you know, the the earlier part of the week I was in, in and around Parliament, uh, quite a bit. wasn't I wasn't there on uh, wasn't there on on Wednesday for the for the, the day of PMQs. Uh, but there's a danger in these circumstances that that the coverage of a political scandal like this can seem like a bit of a game, as though the journalists are relishing it and enjoying it almost as a semi-comical uh, semi-comic event and this story isn't like that it really is people are genuinely appalled that the people who designed the most draconian rules in peacetime who inflicted which were accepted by most of the public at the time but many of us were deeply concerned about the epic social harms inflicted particularly on the poorest and the people who designed those rules uh, carved out for themselves in their own minds some bizarre little exception. And I, the one thing I wanted to flag up in media terms is the use of this term work event by the Prime Minister and by number 10 is most curious. If you listen to the Today programme where Nick Robinson was interviewing Brandon Lewis on Thursday morning, worth listening back to it, we'll put the, the link below. Now, Nick Robinson is a great interviewer but the the thing is so bizarre and the explanations from cabinet ministers and from the prime minister are so ridiculous rather than just accepting the rules were break broken taking the fine taking it on the chin that nick robinson became almost kind of incoherent in his cross-examination of uh, brandon lewis the northern ireland secretary and it all hinges on that term work event which did not exist as a concept or a get out or an excuse in front of a magistrate in at the height of phase one of the pandemic. Oh, I thought I was attending a work event. Work and go through the regulations and the guidance from uh, Whitehall, from the business Whitehall. department on what a secure work environment was, a COVID compliant work environment was, it was basically work from home, which of course, bus drivers can't or lots of um, lots of essential workers in the economy couldn't work from home or if you're going to work only be in meetings if it's absolutely essential and there is no category called work event whether it involves spilling out in the garden into the garden or not it simply simply doesn't exist and I, I would just really want interviewers who are in front of uh, cabinet ministers to just to just test this defence because it is non-existent. It is ridiculous. There is no there was no such thing in May 2020 as a work event. Maggie, what do you want to highlight on this first? Oh, just on that point, Ian, I, I think the fact that they keep repeating it and and it's the only line that they've used is clearly the lawyers have advised them that there might be some sort of get out. It is the only explanation for this, isn't it? Um, mm. But overall. Um, and in fact, that sort of links to the article I wanted to highlight, Paul Goodman, um, a Conservative Home, which is sort of the in-house um, magazine for the Conservative Party. But he, he's looking at, the headline is, Grey Suits Wait for Sue Gray. Um, and he is looking at what, how she can, really how she can investigate um, this with some sort of justice, but he is suggesting that she might well find that she can only really look at the civil service part of it and the spads and to say whether it was a staff gathering, but that she won't go far enough as to sort of destabilize the prime minister and that we'll have to wait for a police investigation. So sounds like there's, he the thinking is there'll be a whitewash, but it does hinge on what is work, what's a work event, and then how does that become a party? But yeah. we know that people from the, um, Henry Newman, uh, who works, uh, where does he works in another department? So it is alleged. It's a, yeah, it is. Yeah, I should stress that it, it's, yeah, I should stress, Maggie, it is alleged that he was there. Alleged, all, sorts sorry, of alleged, all, all sorts of sightings of various people there mm. um, who, uh, it's, un, it's unclear whether they, whether they definitely, uh, definitely were. Mm. But it, um, 
I, I'm not sure on that Sue Gray point. Mm. A lot of people will be unfamiliar mm. with who the great Sue Gray is. She's a very tough official, um, an official who was involved in the, the, the Damien Green case and various other cases uh, involving alleged breaches of you know ethical codes etc so she has a reputation in Whitehall for being incredibly tough there's also a bit of a conspiracy theory who suggested to Boris that Sue Gray was the right person to do it because that that is she, she is potentially from Boris's perspective the very worst and most rigorous sort of person to be appointed who will see it as her role uh, friends and colleagues say to to restore order or as one put it to me, to um, to save the British state sounds rather melodramatic, but after the chaos of the last few years, there's an opportunity for someone to do the right thing and call it as she sees it. But this does hinge on, and there's been a lot of discussion on this among lawyers on Twitter, on her remit and how far that allows, the terms of her inquiry, how far does that actually allow her to go? But she will be very conscious everything in her record suggests that if there's the possibility of a police inquiry uh, and it's difficult to see how that can be avoided then it may be that her job is not to be judge and jury on it her mm -hmm. job is to gather the evidence in an HR HR style way issue a report on her findings on what she thinks happened and then pass it on mm -hmm. to pass it on mm -hmm. to the to the police but just on the politics of it I just wanted to highlight a couple of pieces and as I as I stress this it's it, it's not a game uh, although it might look like that from a distance it is uh, the whole business is incredibly serious I thought Quentin Lett's sketch in the Times was absolutely bang on in the way that it just cap captured that extraordinary atmosphere um, it, you know, I watched it on, on TV, it had been, had been in the chamber earlier in the week. The extraordinary atmosphere at PMQs where, where the benches were packed, but the Tory, Tory MPs were largely silent. Uh, and that's really ominous for Boris because they were, they were watching, listening, working out whether they believed his half apology, whether they found it credible, uh, and also calculating what it means for them in terms of their seats. But there was a... A lovely paragraph at the at the end of Quentin's sketch where he's talking about Jeremy Hunt, who will, of course, be a contender in the leadership race, and Liz Truss. And, and, and Quentin says, as it ended, Truss squeezed uh, Johnson's arm, checking his pulse, question mark, um, and Jacob Rees-Mogg bent down to offer encouragement. And I saw Jeremy Hunt chatting up the backbencher from Bolsover, one of the Red Wall Tories, Times Carousel turns. The other piece which I wanted to highlight, which I think shows you how much trouble Boris is in, in political and in media terms, is uh, was on the front of the Daily Telegraph. Juliet Samuel, the PM buys time at cost of public mockery by admitting he's an idiot. So that is, that's Boris's old old paper, to which presumably at some point, if he is no longer prime minister, he will return as as a, as a columnist. But on the front page of the Daily Telegraph, uh, buys time at a cost of public mockery by admitting he's uh, an idiot. As to what else did you want to flag up on this? Um, well, another piece sort of in that vein, which is uh, Danny Finkelstein's. Um piece a column this week in the times um which kind of t takes the sort of long view on uh on scandals and um and denial of scandals so he, he takes this uh watergate as a bit of a thought experiment um where people often say well it was the cover-up that that really sunk nixon um he says well no it wasn't the cover-up it was the fact that they burglarized <laughs> uh, Democrat headquarters, and then yeah. the cover-up happened because it happened. So the only way to deal with the party case story is to unhappen the parties. That is the only solution. I just thought that was yeah a brilliant way of putting it. it. It's a very clever good. column. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, what we don't know is whether there are going to be more party stories coming out. And if Dominic Cummings is lining up his ammunition, this was obviously his first big big blast 
Well, sub subscribers to Dominic Cummings uh, Substack, which I'm one, uh, yeah. will be excited, looking forward to his, the, the next instalment. But yes, it does feel, and that's it, it does feel as though Cummings is at the heart of this, and he has been mm -hmm. making these predictions on Twitter. You know, there were parties, people involved know that there's more to come. Mm -hmm. So there is this discussion happening in media land about Cummings to to what extent as people close to Dominic Cummings are they to what extent are they drip feeding this out what more does he know what more do other people know and you then also get into this nightmare for the for the prime minister in media terms and I've seen this uh saw this during the financial crisis you'll have seen it Maggie in the aftermath of that I saw it with with RBS um, and, uh, and and other banks is that when people start to think, well, are my colleagues talking? Are they mm -hmm. defending themselves? Mm -hmm. Are they secretly, privately getting their side of the story out? Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's time for me to put my case. Yep, put my case and put my put my side of the story in. So at least I'm represented and I'm not mm -hmm. presented as the as the full guy. And I, I wonder if there are civil servants and advisors and officials feeling that uh, at the moment. So the other piece that I wanted to highlight, great piece of commentary from Robert Shrimsley in the FT. The party really may be over for Johnson. Robert says, traits that once, uh, let me get my glasses, traits that once endeared Johnson to his supporters are now seen as an obstacle to good government. Even this most Teflon leader may find this latest uh, display of amorality proves too much. Voters see both his personal weaknesses and the collapse in his authority uh, uh, over his own MPs. In this matter, Tory MPs will be governed by fear. They will not act till their fear of defeat outweighs their fear of striking, but the gap between those two points is narrowing fast. Do you think, Maggie, do you think Boris is going to survive all of this pressure? Is it a question of days or weeks or does he survive for months or does he indeed just bounce back from this and fight the next election? Oh gosh, Ian. Um, I think I said before Christmas I thought he would survive. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. You know, if you've seen the front page of the Telegraph, the really big picture of him, and you look at his face, he really looks a fairly broken man actually. And uh, Robert and Shrimsley in his piece is right. What he hasn't done this time is what he's done before, which is sort of play slightly the clown, the buffoon. And, you know, yeah, I made a mistake. You know, he never defended all his children, all his wives. Uh, and he hasn't just been able to say, yeah, we had a party. You know, I'm to blame. I should be fined. And everybody else said it was foolish. You know, he's hiding behind lawyers. And so he looks cowardly. And that, in a sense, is not what you want to see. He's not been brave and taken it on the chin. Um, I don't know whether he'll survive. Um, 54, we need 54 MPs to put in their letters. I think that will wait and see what the result of Gray and then the police. I mean, it could be events, events, events. If on the 26th of January, all restrictions come off, COVID sort of disappears and people, the, the economy is not doing too badly as we've seen over the last few days. Of course, we've got energy prices and all the rest of it, but and actually inflation, overall, yeah. and inflation, but overall, actually, um, you know, we're predicted to be one of the fastest growing. Um, you know, I don't know is the answer, but, um, you know, if he should be challenged, it's a pity he hasn't been challenged on sort of net zero and lack of an energy policy yeah. or leveling up or on tax hikes rather yeah. than parties. But that, that's a different point. Yeah, I should I should point out that you're watching a press review on, uh, on 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 YouTube with reaction or you may be listening to this on our uh, weekly podcast where it also goes out. But press review is where we review the stories that have grabbed the attention of the reaction team uh, in the previous seven days or so. If you're not a subscriber to Reaction on YouTube, it's really simple. Hit the subscribe button below. And also, if you want to subscribe to Reaction, the main site where you get my weekly newsletter, you get Maggie's brilliant column, you get lots of other great stuff from the Reaction team. The details are below. And uh, you also get our daily evening briefing from the team and all of our columnists and, and, and writers 
all the details are below. But sorry, I interrupted you there, um, Maggie, but on the economic stuff there, there was a very good piece by Doug McWilliams, one of our writers on US inflation and the implications. Fascinating there to see him thinking in terms of Doug's always you know, ahead of uh, ahead of the curve yeah. economically. And him talking in terms of just because of the size of that, that number, US inflation hitting seven seven percent seven percent and there's been his is a great piece of writing on it the implication of that if it keeps on going and we'll come to the story that i'm going to highlight which suggests that it will then you're in a situation where he, you could get quite serious um hit to asset prices Absolutely. in the us as if that sweeps then through equities through real estate um, corporate bonds, all manner of other things. Then, I mean, he he was talking in terms of a, a hit to asset prices over eighteen months of something like I think sort of fifteen to twenty five, fifteen to twenty five percent, which is a is a massive hit, which would stall the recovery and stall uh, well tip us into recession. In fact, uh, yeah. and it's interesting because Doug has been quite a hawk on interest rate rises as a way of controlling. It never controls, but curtailing. Yeah. Um, inflation, but now he's actually thinks, and I, I agree with him on this, that the US is going to be very, it's going to have to be very cautious about how much, by how much it puts up rates and and when, because, you know, if they're saying they're going to do it three times next year, but, you know, if they were a too hard a hit and you could just tip prices, the market's just going to free fall and growth. And I mean, Biden, the Biden administration is not going to like that. They're not going to oversee that. So, probably interest rates are going to stay pretty low for some time to come. Or, but then or, or the moves will be very tiny, quarter of a basis point, quarter of a point. You see, I'm not sure. I'm not not sure about that, um, Maggie. No. Isn't, there, isn't there the possibility if if um, if, if 7%, I mean, it could, it could easily be just got to spike to 8, 9, 10%. If you start to get numbers like that, and as various people have pointed out, I think Andrew Lillico pointed out on, on Twitter this week, consumers below the age of 40 have never uh, experienced anything like this. I and mean, it's in inflation. It's just a settled fact of life that it is around 2%. And there have been, of course, there was a spike after the financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis when QE had been used and it, it, you know, it, it spiked up for a bit, but it proved not to be sustained, which mm-hmm. is maybe where central bankers at the moment are getting their thinking in terms of it having been potentially transitory, mm. but if it's if it's not, and this I want to hi- the next story that I want to highlight on this one does have a political implication because I think inflation and energy is going to be the big story of the year and the combination for Boris of all of this sleaze stuff plus punters feeling um, and getting poorer could I think that's ultimately what could do for him. But um, just want to highlight a piece that uh, Sam Lowe had had highlighted from Bloomberg this morning which is uh or, or uh, from from wednesday from bloomberg which is the mother of all supply shocks lurks in china's covid mm. crackdowns which um i think sam Lowe said not now world economy not now so you know the last thing that people last thing that people need but the the point is a piece written by um endo current for Bloomberg, the world economy could be headed for the mother of all supply chain stumbles, which picks up on a report from HSBC um, economists, economists who are warning that, of course, Omicron hitting China um, it says if the highly infectious Omicron variant already swamping much of the global economy spreads across Asia, especially China, then disruption to manufacturing will be inevitable. And we've seen this at various points in the crisis, haven't we, where you get a spike in China and they then have to shut down the factories, curtail shipping. And, you know, China is the world's biggest trading nation. And the global recovery needs China to keep pumping out goods and keep keep shipping. And if you get some some kind of restriction on that thanks to omicron then of course that's it that doesn't that then maggie act as a a spur to further inflation um yes absolutely it it would because prices of 
raw materials would go up, prices of uh, shipping, all those sort of big, um, big, big uh, costs would go shooting up. And in fact, it was one of the reasons for the supply chain um, uh, chaos and then the rise in prices was that post lockdowns, everybody suddenly demanded goods. So all the Chinese factories, their demand went up by 10, 15% and they didn't have the fuel and so forth. So it's this vicious circle each time. Um, yeah. Well, we can only hope that Omicron won't spread quite as fast. But the, the so the argument against just for context, the argument against uh, aggressive rate rises mm. has been has been that actually there is this fragility, not entirely out of the pandemic. Mm. Don't know what's coming next in terms of Omicron mm. and, and supply chains, and so it could, for that reason, be transitory. And as I think Simon Nixon in the in the in the in the Times has noted at various points in various columns in the last you know in, in the last six months or so if you look at the way in which the bond market has been mm. priced in the in, in the US essentially the the long tail of the bond market predicts and we talked about it before Christmas Maggie predicts you know, a burst of inflation and then that tipping into something close to recession hope not but potentially recession mm. then the concern becomes deflation and that's how you know Wall Street, uh, you know, bond markets have been been thinking about things, but we'll see. But there is, I just think there's the possibility there of, uh, you know, the un, sort of un, unintended um, consequence or unforeseen or unforeseen consequence of the Omicron um, business that you then get further supply con constraints on supply and then some really punchy, quite scary unemployment uh, uh, inflation spikes in the next few months numbers that maybe begin with a you know begin with a begin with a, a a one just to pose that question which i asked maggie alistair just on on boris i mean not so much will he survive do you think he should survive you've listened to the explanations the apology just before we started recording this you were you were we were talking through the the impact of the rules in that first phase and the the you know the the visions it created in society. Do you think he deserves to survive? Uh, yeah, my emotional response is uh, is no, for for two kind of slightly distinct reasons. Um, I think he presided. He the, the culture that he's presided over in government, and that sort of emanated into the press, is one. This kind of slight this inability to see the kind of full picture of what was actually happening in this country and a kind of denial a kind of denial of of the kind of the reality that households and people working in hospitality and arts were facing and i, I think that the, the changes over the last couple of years you know so people who are sort of um on that side of the argument who are generally kind of professionals who can work from home will say the changes that the lockdowns introduced were happening anyway we were all moving to a flexible work environment we were all moving into this world but mm. people who are my age or people who are on the other side of that divide who might not benefit directly from that kind of new dispensation all we have asked for the last couple of years is for those changes to be more bearable and for the pace of change perhaps to be reduced. And to do that, you needed a leader and a leadership who were willing to articulate precisely why we were doing the things we were doing, what the costs were and the harms were, justifying the harms in light of the benefits, continually explaining that to the British people. And then at the end of it all, able, Abraham Lincoln style to, to talk about reconciliation and a way of healing those divides. Boris, unfortunately, has been totally unfit for that project. He has done zilch of that. So yeah. that's one reason. The second reason is you cannot continue having, um, you know, spent the last couple of years justifying rules, which I've seen friends of mine who work in the art sector have their lives completely changed and but not just that for 
over a year having to completely change the way they work because of rules that his government have made often rules which were at times seem pretty ridiculous and livelihood course. livelihoods wrecked businesses destroyed yeah spending pouring money I, I i saw someone working in a restaurant who had an outdoor bit who to keep the restaurant open for the kind of wintry periods in 2020 had installed sort of uh, outdoor roofing to stop the rain um no, no hindrance to ventilation at all it seemed like a really good idea in may he was saying that because the government had said that, that there was a requirement for roofing to counters outside space, he was having to make huge changes to that, dismantle them at huge personal cost. So that's the, sec the second more concrete aspect. I think there is a sort of, there's the kind of philosophical, what's a good leader in a crisis and how do we exit the crisis with a, with a better leader? And I think there are many people who are more capable than Boris of, of articulating where we want to go and, and what it meant. And second, there's the fundamental point of honour that he should be dwelling on, which is that he doesn't he doesn't seem to have the moral courage to admit yeah. that he got this stuff really badly wrong, and he got it wrong repeatedly, as we have as we've seen. And that moral, I, it, you just feel not let down, but it's just you you really think that we should demand more in our leaders than than what Boris seems to give, and it's all it's been obvious to me for. I've written about this for three or four years. Um, mm. You know, for reaction is that I've always thought he's just obviously for whatever brilliant justification people have for Boris or um, excuses they make for him, he, he's a defective leader and he doesn't think deeply about what leadership means. And was it not so great? Yeah. He's never going to be a great prime minister. Uh, it's that... not, not great commentary, but it's just. He's not good enough. We, just, we should get someone else. And, and <laughs> just because it doesn't seem immediately apparent that what, who that new person should be, that process should start now because people will come forward. There will be surprises. There'll be new people. Um, exactly. And we need that. Dem I think we need that sort of democratic debate to happen. Actually, Maggie, Maggie, you're um, you you were going to jump in there, and then I'm just going to wrap things up with one thing from the Daily Telegraph. Well, adding to um, Alistair's point, I think if there's a leadership challenge, um, there'll be new faces, and not new to those within the Westminster bubble, but perhaps the general public haven't heard of, um, rather like Thatcher, if she liked, she came up on the outside. I suspect we might see a couple of um, new faces, other than the obvious ones, which was my last choice, the uh, Rishi Sunak, who yeah. it rather looks from that headline, the Telegraph might be supporting. Um, I think they're backing both forces, aren't they, Sunak or Truss? But I think they're both too too obvious, actually. Maybe I'm just being optimistic and hopeful. Quite like to see yeah. somebody. Well, I think Ma underneath. Maggie. Yeah, I think Maggie. Aren't, yeah. Two of us are going to discuss oh, yeah. aren't we, tomorrow. Yeah. So, we, so look out for uh, for that. It'll be on the it'll be on the podcast, but also look out for on, on video. We'll have a discussion and run through the runners and riders. But yes, further to your point on the on the on the Telegraph. Maggie, I was just really struck by the Telegraph leader on, on on Thursday morning. The PM's fate now rests with his party. This is the Daily Telegraph, the newspaper for which Boris was star columnist for, for many years. And it's such an equivocal leader. I mean, it's a very good leader, but it, 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 it is it, it's not at all an endorsement. Nope. I'll just quote from it in the final paragraph. Mr. Johnson now imagines his fate rests in the hands of Ms. Gray and her report, which may well decline to point a finger directly at the Prime Minister if there are any ambiguities in the rules. However, the truth is that his future will be determined by the MPs sitting behind him who are having to take the brunt of their voters' fury. Many now question whether he has either the judgment or authority to take the party forward to the next general election. That's the daily telegraph on that note i think we're going to wrap up this episode of press review you've been watching press review with me ian martin and my colleagues maggie pagano and alistair ben you can also listen to this on uh, on our on our pod podcast if you're not a subscriber to reaction on youtube just click subscribe on the button below and also become become a subscriber to the main site details below until next time thank you very much for joining us <laughs>